Hey, what's going on guys? This is Youth Man. I am super pumped to share this video with you. This is something that I've been wanting to do over the past several months and have been working on gathering the content for this video over the past several weeks. Now, if this is the first time that you and I are meeting, my name is Michael Stevens. Thanks so much for stopping by the channel. I produce weekly content on home theater tips, tours, as well as reviews. So if that interests you, make sure you're subscribed. Now, I have been interested in audio and home theater for about 30 years. I absolutely love home theater and I love sharing my passion with you guys. But what I've learned over the years is building a home theater takes time. And sometimes when we look online and we see people posting pictures of these awesome setups, we kind of get disheartened thinking, man, I'll never have something that nice. Well, I want to share with you in this video just my journey over the past 15 years of building this theater room here and just kind of give you some inspiration that if you put your mind to it and save up a little bit of money and get creative, you can build an incredible home theater in your space. Now, before we jump over to the computer and I share with you my journey of building this home theater, I wanna give a big thanks to today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with tens of thousands of classes for creators, business professionals, and people that are looking to learn new skills. They've got classes on creative writing, film and video, graphic design, music, photography, website development, as well as entrepreneurship, leadership, and management and marketing. Now, I've been using Skillshare for over a month and really love what I'm learning, and I'm currently going through a course with John Pateo on iPhone photography and how to use it to its full potential. I'm learning some new tips that will help me take better photos when I do not want to lug around my larger mirrorless camera. Every Skillshare class allows you to go at your own pace. You can choose to either go through a class from start to finish, or you can jump around through each section to learn a specific skill or even a technique. One thing I really like about the classes is most of them are under 60 minutes with short lessons to fit almost any schedule. And the cool thing is Skillshare is offering for the first 1,000 of you to click on the link down in the description. You're going to receive a one month free trial to Skillshare so you can access their entire library and check it out for yourself. So be sure to check out the link down in the description below. So this is a video I've been wanting to make for quite some time now. And so I'm excited to share uh, a lot of photos that I have never really shared with you guys on my channel. And so where this kind of comes from is sometimes we look online and we see somebody's home theater and we kind of see the end product. We see something that has taken place over sometimes many years or many months. And we're looking at that thinking, man, I'll never be able to get to that point. Um, I've even received comments saying things like, oh, it must be nice to be rich. It has nothing to do with being rich, but everything to do with being patient. And so I just want to take you through kind of my home theater journey. We're going to go all the way back 15 years ago when we first bought this home and it had a uh, what they call a media room. And so let's just go ahead and, and start with uh, this is going way, way back. So right before we moved into this home, this was my home theater setup. I had a little dinky TV, uh, two clip speakers, a clip center channel. Over on the far left is a 15 inch Velodyne sub. A really, really old, I think it was a ProLogic Harman Kardon 5.1 channel uh, receiver and just a really generic Sony DVD player. And so I share this because this is truly kind of where my home theater journey began. Um, this whole system, all three of those speakers and the subwoofer, I paid like $200 for and so the reality is you can have a nice home theater even if you don't have a big budget. And so uh, we'll just go ahead and keep going. So here we are. We move into our um, a home that we live in now. So we've been here about 15 years. And so what you're looking at here is my theater room before anything has taken place. We only have carpet in there. And so this room is 13 feet wide by 19 foot deep. 10 foot ceilings over on the far right you can see there's a double sliding glass door 
up at the top left, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a really long, um, elongated kind of window up there. And so then if we look at the rear of the room, this is looking back at the entry door right there. Over on the far right would be where my risers are currently. And then over on the left is that double sliding glass door. So as you can see, this isn't a dedicated theater room. It's just a space that I envision that one day I want to have a dedicated theater room in this space. And so we began that process. So the first thing I did back then, I really didn't consider going with projection mainly because of the cost. And so at that time, 55 inch TVs were kind of like the, the kind of like the main size that people were buying. And so I went online, went to walmart.com, pulled up a 55 inch TV and, you know, got the dimensions for it. Went out to my garage, grabbed the uh, blue masking tape and marked that off on my wall. I stepped back to the back of my room and I looked at that small screen and I just took a deep sigh because I realized that would never give me this full experience of a home theater. Um, and so that was kind of like my aha moment that I really want to make this room more than just a media room, but a really a dedicated theater room. And so the two speakers on the right, you can see I upgraded from the smaller clip speakers. These are the RF-83s. I actually built a website for a company that was local to me. Uh, they were a home theater installer. And I basically reached out to them and said, in a nutshell, your website stinks. I can make it better. I'm broke. I need some speakers would you be willing to kind of trade with me? And that wasn't exactly how it went, but that's basically what I was saying. But they were excited. They bought the speakers brand new from Clips. And then the center channel on the bottom is the RC7. Um, I ended up selling the previous uh, center channel that you saw in that last photo and upgraded to that one. That was a Craigslist find. And so I picked that up, I think, probably for $150. And so we'll just keep going. So I began to draw stuff up in Photoshop. Um, I'm a visual person and so I tried to to draw out and map out what I thought this was going to look like. Initially I was kind of thinking maybe a 120 inch screen but as you'll see in a in a future photo um, I didn't quite get that big just yet but I had high-end uh, kind of uh, ambitions for my home theater. So here again, I went into Photoshop and I kind of drew it out. And initially I was looking at a 16 by nine screen. I had the RF 83s from Klipsch. I had the RC 64 was looking somewhere between 110, 120 inch screen. Um, you can see my dimensions there, my room 13 by 19, 10 foot ceilings, and then my two sides round. So at that time I only had five speakers um, in the room. And so I reached out to a cabinet maker. I don't even remember how I found him, but I knew I wanted some kind of cabinet up front. I wanted to be able to house my equipment, um, but I've got this big 13 foot by, you know, 10 foot cabinet that I need made. And so I reached out to a cabinet maker and I said, hey, here's what I'm looking to do. Again, I'm youth man, so I like to barter when I can. I like to create win-win situations for people. And so this guy did not have a website and I offered to build his website in exchange for him building this cabinet. And so he drew this diagram and, and we started working back and forth on, you know, what that might look like. And so he drew some more sketches. And so we began that process. So while we're in the process of building that and he's kind of working on it over at the shop, I began shopping. And so I go on Craigslist and I ended up purchasing these front theater seats. These were my front row at that time. Um, I bought those for $700, and so they were used, but the guy had them in his second home. He was a realtor, and that was when the housing market just really tanked, and so he was selling his second property, and he had these theater seats that were pretty much brand new, and he rarely used them, so I got a really great deal on that. I think he told me he paid $2,300 for just those three. So again, here's some more cabinet uh, drawings and renderings, and we're just trying to figure out, you know, what kind of space am I going to be looking at and the dimensions of that. So again, it just kind of helped me to visualize what that looked like. And so here's another, uh, just a 3D rendering of that. And so here's where it starts to get interesting. So I wanted to be able to use my theater room 
um, but I didn't have the equipment yet. I did not have um, any kind of screen. I didn't have a projector. And so all I had was, I think, this little 19-inch TV. And so I brought my PlayStation in. At that time, the PS3 was the best Blu-ray player, really, um, as far as the speed. And uh, back then, uh, Blu-ray players took a long time, like almost a minute just to boot up. And so the PS3 was great for that. And down at the bottom was a Yamaha uh, AVR. Again, I purchased that used. I think I paid maybe 400 bucks for that. And so that was the setup initially. And so I'm just sitting on those seats, no front cabinet, no screen, no theater, but it was a start. So here is the back seats. Now the front seats and the back seats were two totally different brands, totally different manufacturers. But again, this was a Craigslist find. Um, well, I guess not really a Craigslist. I had a friend that was a realtor. She called me their realty um, their demo room was being taken apart. Somebody was buying the home and they had these theater seats. So basically these were brand new. Um, very few people actually even sat in them and it definitely wasn't used on a regular basis. And I paid 600 bucks for those. So that was just another one of those great youth man deals. So here I picked up the, uh, the center channel from clips. So once again, I actually bought that brand new from clips. They had a sale on it. I think I paid around $500 for that, maybe $550, so that's the RC64, um, and that thing was a monster, man. That was the biggest center channel I had ever seen in my life at that time, and so then I ended up purchasing a um, an Elite screen. I began to research, um, you know, what can I afford, and so at that time, I, I really didn't want to go with 120 because it was a lot more money, and I ended up deciding on a 103-inch Elite screen. Um, I think I paid about $500 for it about that time. And so it wasn't anything fancy, but we began to build the theater room. So to the, to the top right, you can see all these wires coming down out of the attic. That was all the speaker wires for my surrounds that I had run back there. Um, I think the red wire over there is a, a remote turn on cable. I figured I needed that for my projector. And literally, I just cut a hole in the ceiling and I just brought those wires through. So there was no uh, um, kind of tidying up of that. You can also see I began to paint the room. And so um, the room was like a really dark burgundy. It was always difficult in my videos and my photos to really capture the deep red of it. It almost looked like fire engine red, but it was definitely not that. So here, uh, as you can see, this is kind of that fire engine red. Uh, we painted the ceiling black, and that is something that I really, really recommend to those of you that are building your home theater. It definitely opens up the space, just makes it look really nice. And initially, honestly, I was really hesitant to even paint the ceiling black. I'm thinking, man, who paints their ceiling black? But then also, who also or who has a dedicated theater room too? So I figure, what the heck? Let's go ahead and go for it. And I'm really glad that I did. So that pipe right there, that was just some PVC pipe. I spray painted it black. That was going to be inside the cabinet. So really the only time it ever be seen is when I open up the cabinet doors to get to the speakers, the main left and right speaker. Um, but I just painted it black so that it would kind of look, you know, at least somewhat tidy there. So now we begin to build the riser. So the riser was something that I had just been on the AVS forum and just really began to see, for the most part, it's a pretty simple build. Um, you pick up some, I think I went with two by 12s because I wanted to make sure it was tall enough for that rear. Um, you've got some sheets of plywood and um, you know some nails. Uh, we used uh, wood glue as well as screws. And so, and then of course we just bought some carpet. So we began to do that. And uh, we also decided to put insulation in it. And in a way it kind of acts as a big base trap. And so you can see we've got insulation stuffed in there. The carpet's already on it. Uh, we had built a step on the left side and a step on the front right. Um, and then eventually, um, you know, we wanted to run some step lights in there. But honestly, that's just one of those projects that never really got finished. But you'll see here we ran Romex up to the front. Um, that allows me to plug in my... Uh, theater seats directly to that riser and then in the very back you'll see it in another uh, photo in a moment um, there's a custom power plug back there and so here again we just got some 
some wood glue just to kind of, I didn't want to be stepping on the riser and hearing it creak and crack. And so we wanted to make sure that that, that did not happen. So I wood glued it and then we also screwed it down and, and it's absolutely rock solid. And that joker is heavy as I'll get out. So here's the finished riser other than the step lights. And so at the bottom right, right down here, I, don't know, I guess you can't really see my mouse, but anyway, the bottom right by that step, um, there's supposed to be a little step light and I've just, actually we did install them, um, but we bought the wrong ones. We bought the ones that were 12 volt. And so when you plug it into 110, they kind of blow and I never really found a replacement for them. So we just left them, but there's a, a switch right as you walk in the door. It's just a light switch that turns those step lights on. Um, but again, I've just never really got around to that. And then you can see that custom power cord in the very back. So here's another just side shot of the finished riser. And then over to the far left, you can see that little light switch that turns on and off the uh, step lights that really aren't there yet. So here we have the uh, rear seats. Those are installed, brought in the front seats. And again, you can see they don't really exactly match, but they look great to me. I never had that. Up in the middle of the ceiling, you can see all the wires coming down for the projector. And then I mounted um, the rear speaker brackets for my surrounds. Now you can tell those sound surrounds are really way too high, but I didn't have a whole lot of choice because of that left door. So again, I had to make some compromises and I even have a video on my channel called My Theater Room Has Issues and that is one of them that I mentioned. So here's just behind the seats. A lot of guys ask me, Michael, why don't you add some rear near field subwoofers? There really isn't any space back there. I mean, I have a few inches, maybe six, eight, 10 at the most. And so not really much can go back there other than some lighting that I store. So here I have some clips RB, I think those were RB 35s. They were massive bookshelves. But again, as you can see, you can't really tilt those down very much. I think the angle on those brackets were like seven degrees. And so it really didn't make a difference. And later on, I would upgrade those to uh, some different surrounds. So here was my first like real projector. I bought a Panasonic AE3000. Um, over the process of a couple of years, I ended up upgrading that several times, but that served me very well. And it was an awesome, awesome projector. Couldn't believe at that time I spent like 2,500 bucks on it. That was a lot of money for me. And, um, and, and that was just a big expense, but I knew that that's what I was wanting to do. So I had saved up my money. I think I would use some income tax refund and was able to purchase that and was really excited for that. So here I have two subwoofers um, on the left. I'm sorry, on the right is a Velodyne F1500. That was from that original um, system that I showed you at the very beginning of this video. And then I found a great deal on a, um, an upgraded version of that. So the one on the right was like 15 inches with a 250 watt amp. The one on the left is a 15 inch. It's a Velodyne HGS 15. That has a 15 inch with a 1250 watt amp continuous, I think 3200 peak had a nicer finish. And so I ended up upgrading to that. And then later on, I found a second one and I'll show you a photo of that here just shortly. So projector is mounted back there at that time. It was in the room. It was going to be um, shot on a 103 inch screen. So mounting it in the room, honestly, that was a big pain because if you can imagine, once you step up onto that riser, that projector was pretty much hitting me right on the head. And so we had to be real careful, especially for guys that were above six foot walking into the room. They kind of had to duck their head. So here we have the beginning of the cabinet. Um, the guy began to work on it. He began to bring it over individual pieces and pretty much it was like three, uh, I guess technically it's five pieces. So there's the bottom piece, the middle piece, the top piece, and then there's a left and a right door that's going to conceal that right side and that left side. So you can kind of take a look. It was just some cheap laminate on some regular wood. Honestly, this thing was really, really poorly designed. Um, a lot of flaws in it a lot of gaps in the, um, you know, in the, in the cabinetry. And then even the doors sagged real bad and he didn't have real good locking mechanisms and just, um, 
But the reality was he did a much better job than I ever could have done. So I was still, you know, really pleased with that. So this is a look behind the screen. Once the screen was installed, you can see just kind of behind there. So this is really up above that. In a minute, I'll show you where the center channel was going to go. This was not a acoustic transparent screen. So I couldn't put any kind of speakers directly behind that. Looking back, I probably should have went with an AT screen and place my center channel directly behind there, but I did not do that. So here you see the RF 83s kind of in those uh, little cabinet doors. That door right there was just on a hinge. And so I could easily grab the hinge and open it up and get access to those speakers or, you know, in the future, if I were to upgrade those. So here you can kind of see it without the doors on. So the, it's starting to take shape. But uh, as you can see, it's just um, it's incomplete and it kind of stayed that way, I think, for over a month. But I began to utilize it and, you know, enjoy it. So this is the center channel. It's up at the very top. I'm going to back up a slide. So if you look at the very, very top, um, that center square up there, that's where this center channel is. And so it's really, really high. I did have it angled down, but it always was weird because the tweeters for the left and right speaker were so different than the tweeter that was way up in the air. And so that every time something panned from left to center to right, my ears just immediately looked up because you could definitely hear it coming from much higher. So that definitely is not ideal. But again, it's what I had to work with. So had the center channel um, angled down up there. And so here we have the doors installed. And so for the most part, I was really pleased. I mean, I finally had this cabinet. I finally had my projector installed. I had the theater seating and the riser. And I began to use my home theater. And so here's another kind of uh, pulled back version. You can see um, I now have acoustic panels. I picked those up from a neighbor for like 11 bucks a piece. They were DIY uh, acoustic panels, nothing fancy, pretty just basic type, but they added just a really um, next level of clarity and detail to my room because before I added those, I had just this real bad slap echo and um, you could clap one time and it would just kind of boing, boing, boing all around my room. It was just sounded horrendous. The curtains up there, they blocked out the light, but they weren't thick. So they weren't really adding much um, acoustic wise. And so in the room, I just had a lot of hard surfaces. So adding those acoustic panels really, really made a difference, even though I only at that time had five of them. So you can see the side surrounds, those had been installed. Those were either the, actually I think those were the Klipsch RS52s, uh, later on upgraded to the 62s, and then later on upgraded to the 62 version 2s that I have right now. So again, here's just another shot of the room. So this is a custom mount. Um, over one of the challenges that I had, uh, you can't really see it here, but that far right side, there's a red curtain. So the issue I had was there's a double sliding glass door there and it's kind of hard to mount a speaker on a double sliding glass door, but that's exactly where my speaker needed to be. So I reached out to a friend of mine and he said, man, we'll just make you a custom mount. And so this is what he drew up and he said, hey, here's kind of what I'm envisioning and we'll just kind of go through. So this was constructed out of um, some kind of metal tubing. And so he welded it for me and then he showed me how it would just simply attach to the back of my speaker. So we'll just go through those. And so this is the, the piece that he constructed and fabricated. He sent that to me. There's three screws, screwed it into the wall, um, dropped the um, speaker cable down the wire or down the tubing, and then to the back of the speaker that was going to be on the bottom. So here you can see, uh, I think this was the Klipsch RB35s that I began with. Um, and so that mounted there. And again, later I would update that several times. So you can kind of see it installed and there it is kind of mounted up on the wall. And I still use that bracket to this day to have my right surround just kind of floating in front of that um, double sliding glass door on the curtain there. So here you can see um, just kind of hanging there. And again, these aren't really ideal. At that time, that was still within Dolby specs because we were uh, doing Dolby. I think at that time it was probably Dolby True HD and DTS Master. 
And at that time, Dolby recommended your surrounds be two to three feet above your ears uh, at your seated position. And so the back rear surrounds are definitely way higher than that. The left ones were, they were a stretch. But again, the biggest thing is if you can imagine walking into the room from that back door, you're going to walk right straight in front of that speaker and you're probably going to smack it with your face. So I had to make sure I mounted it a little bit higher. So these are just some upgraded speakers. It's either the RS uh, 52s or 62s. And so I upgraded those side surrounds. And then here they are kind of again, just mounted there. So then I started to add some power. So this was one I found on Craigslist, drove all the way up to Jacksonville. Um, this was a hard buy for me. This was a 10 year old amp and the gentleman had it. He was in the clips forum and um, he was wanting $750. And man, I tried and tried and tried to get him down to about $500 and he would not budge. But I finally made the decision, hey, I want to go get this amp. And I drove all the way to Jacksonville. He had it set up with a um, just some beautiful um, clips horns and uh, had a chance to listen to it. We unhooked it. I bought it, brought it home, hooked it up to my system. And honestly, it just wasn't a big difference for me. Um, so I was kind of like let down. I'm like, man, I just spent $750 and I don't hear $750 worth of difference. Um, it was a 220 watt by five channel amplifier. And basically I was just adding that to an AVR, um, with the pre outs, but it wasn't that big of a difference, but I ended up rocking that for several years. So above we've got the Yamaha. I think that was the RX V 1800 great AVR when I was running five speakers. Uh, when I ended up running seven speakers, it just really ran out of gas. And that's one of the reasons why I purchased the, um, the five channel amplifier to kind of help out with that. Um, PS three, I think down at the bottom, right? That was the old school fat one. And just the few, uh, Blu-rays that I have, uh, over there at the time. So then I wanted to dive into the world of separates, you know, would that make a difference? And so at that time, the cheapest separates, uh, the cheapest processor was the Emotiva UMC one. Um, Unfortunately, Emotiva, um, kind of in true fashion, their processor was really, really buggy at that time. And, and I've reviewed some of you know their newer ones, the RMC1, and um, not even too long ago, a couple years ago, and kind of found the same thing. It was quite buggy. But it sounded good. Um, it just had some issues. But I rocked that for a little while and, and later on ended up um, you know selling that and, and going a different route. Down at the bottom left, we had the Wii in the theater room. Um, I think in the middle, that was an old school Rotel. Uh, it looked kind of cool, or maybe it was Marantz. I can't remember. Um, but it looked cool, but it, it really wasn't anything that fancy, but it just looked nice. And then the uh, UMC one above that. So down at the bottom left, you can see that's that new um, Velodyne HGS subwoofer. So I had one at that time and, and the, all the equipment in the middle. And then later on, I ended up buying a second one. And that was the first experience I had with dual subwoofers. And man, it rocked. I absolutely loved it. Uh, just enjoyed those subwoofers very, very much. Um, they just added a whole new dimension to my room and added quite a bit of depth that I didn't have with the first Velodyne sub that I had. So these are just some random speakers that I had accumulated and purchased on Craigslist. Um, they were the B&W DM... Uh, what was that? 602 S version twos, I think. Um, or 604 S anyway, something like that. It's the 604 S twos, I believe. And then the middle speakers were the clips R. uh, let's see, I'm sorry. Those were the KLF thirties. And so those had dual 12 inch great speaker. Um, but it had water damage. Uh, you can't really see it in the image, but I think I paid literally like 150 bucks for both of them and just played with them for a little while and enjoyed them, but they, they look pretty bad. So I ended up selling those. And then of course I kept the RF 83s, uh, that are the, the innermost speakers. So looks like that's the same photo, but look at the, um, uh, if you look at the bottom three squares below the screen, you can see how those doors are sagging real bad. So again, that was just part of the kind of the shoddy work that, 
wasn't really fit and finish. Um, and again, there were just a lot of gaps in, in each of those components. But again, I enjoyed it and it worked well for my situation. I added an acoustic panel on the back wall and that helped with some of those rear reflections. And then even some bass traps over in the far right. It's funny, I actually used those for several years. I mean, we're talking six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. One day when I got REW and a calibration microphone, I took some measurements with and without them and saw zero change in the bass response. So I ended up just getting rid of those. And um, so I don't know if it was because they were just poorly made, if it was because I didn't have enough of them and there were only two in that back corner, but they weren't really adding any value to the room. So I removed those. Um, that's just the side surrounds with no grills on. Upgraded my um, Parasound amp to a Sherborne. Now this is a, I think it was a seven channel amplifier. I think 200 by seven. It was basically seven monoblock amplifiers inside one chassis. This Joker was a beast. Uh, the 72100A uh, was the model number on it. That thing was absolutely just incredible. Um, you can kind of see the topography in here and just kind of how that was laid out. Um, but I used that for a long time um, until I later on bought some Lascalas, and then I just no longer felt that I heard a difference, so I ended up selling that. These are some custom mounts for the rear speakers. I got some uh, either the RS-52s or the RS-62s, and a friend of mine, the same guy that constructed the, the metal bracket for the side, said, hey, let's try to mount your rear surrounds and angle those down uh, quite a bit more so that you hear those more, at least in your front row. And so he made those just out of wood, nothing fancy there. And I think they use a French cleat design to kind of mount those to the wall. So here you can see they're angled a lot further down and definitely added, um, you know, just a better element of rear surrounds to my room. So here you can see those are installed there. So here's where I bought the La Scala's. Um, Honestly, I bought them as a, I just wanted to hear them. I found a great deal on them uh, locally, ended up trading some speakers that I didn't need and literally a couple hundred bucks um, for these. I think I paid like 400 bucks plus the speakers and um, ended up liking them so much. I ended up selling my RF-83s and then I had to figure out what do I do next. You know, how in the world am I going to get these La Scala's that sound incredible, where are they going to fit behind the screen? And if I'm going to do a theater room, then I want to do three La Scala's. And where's that going to go? Because that's not an AT screen. So I reached out to a friend of mine. I said, man, what do we do? He's like, we'll just build you a cabinet. I'm like, what do you mean we'll just build you a cabinet? He's like, well, I'll just build you a cabinet. And so we began to make some some designs and, and started thinking through that process. And so here's a, just a closer look at the La Scala's. Those were made in 1980. So they were like 40 years old. Um, but ended up finding a third one from a gentleman in, I think he was in North Carolina or South Carolina, gave me a super good deal on it. And he said, Hey, Michael, um, I'm going to be down in Florida in like another month. I'll just bring it to you. We'll come by and hang out. And so he brought them, gave him the money, gave him a gift card as a, a thank you um, for delivering them. And we enjoyed hanging out. But I ended up selling the um, the RF-83s and the matching center channel. And then now I had three La Scala's but didn't know how I was going to, you know, like where am I going to put these? And so we began to make some plans on the new cabinet and the kind of the youth man version 2.0 of my home theater. So in thinking through that, I'm like, well, if we're going to rebuild the cabinet, I might as well kind of go bigger with my screen. But I didn't know how big was going to be too big. My front seats were, you know, I couldn't move them back any further because of the riser and because just the length of my room. And so I ended up picking up just some big construction paper and stretched it across the front of my cabinet and shot my projector up there just to kind of get an idea of, you know, how big you know, do I want to go? And so we ended up drawing up, um, my friend did this in, I think it was called Google Sketch at that time. Um, but I ended up deciding, hey, I want to go as big as I can. 
And measurements wide, I ended up going with a 150 inch screen in 2.35 to 1. And you can see this is the initial um, drawing. Originally, I was going to have those little cabinet spaces up at the very top. Um, but as you can see in, well, you'll see later, and if you already know my theater room, that kind of completely changed. The other big change was originally I was going to make it gray or black. Um, pretty much, I guess it was going to be black. But the thought there is I wanted it to disappear. But what ended up happening is over time, as he began to send me pictures of what this cabinet looked like, I knew that I could not hide the beauty of the wood with paint. Um, it just wasn't happening. And so we ended up changing that to a natural wood color. But this helped me again to visualize. I'm very visual. And so I, I liked being able to see that physically. And then we could go back and forth on what changes I needed to make. And so, you know, he was able to put my Scalas behind there. And um, a couple things that were really important when designing this, as I told him, I want two things. I want to be able to have easy access to my speakers that are behind the screen, and I want to have easy access to the equipment, you know, because if I swap out a, an AVR, and again, this was way before me doing the YouTube thing, and so uh, this was just me upgrading over time, and I knew I would be doing that, and so I wanted to be able to get behind my equipment and, and change uh, that out easily. So he said, okay, we'll put your screen on gas shocks. That'll let you uh, easily lift that up, and you can get to your uh, speakers easy. And then he said, I'll take the middle part of the cabinet and we'll just put that on rails. And so we were able to buy some rails that I think they support either 300 or 500 pounds. Uh, I think it's actually 500 pounds. And so they were really, really heavy duty industrial rails. And so that's what we ended up going with. But this, again, just helped me to visualize uh, what I was kind of getting into. And so I think we ended up building the cabinet for... I want to say it was just over two thousand um, dollars. Two, honestly, I'd have to go back and look. It's either two or three thousand um, dollars. Now that I think about it, it's probably three thousand. But I ended up buying and selling some speakers, and ended up using the profit from that to fully fund that three thousand uh, dollar investment on the cabinet. And he just charged me for um, the uh, the materials. And so here you can see, I ended up selling the Velodyne subwoofers, ended up buying a uh, Klipsch RSW15 subwoofer. Man, it was a huge difference. Um, for whatever reason, that subwoofer was just absolutely amazing. Had a ton of slam. And one of the RSW15s had the same output as two of those Velodyne subs. So I sold the Velodynes, ended up buying a first Clips RSW15, then it ended up buying a second one, and then later on, you know, so Sean ended up putting uh, the uh, speakers in there so I could kind of visualize what those would look back like back there. And so here we decided, okay, well, let's add some columns. We changed the top design instead of having a bunch of little cabinets, maybe some uh, longer um, cabinets up top. And then I ended up buying two more RSW-15s. And uh, so I said, hey, go ahead and put those back there. So this is just a picture of the demolition. It's like, okay, now it's time. We're getting close to um, assembling this. And so we need to get the old cabinet out of there. So I disassembled that. Uh, oh, I totally forgot. There's two base traps back there. You can see there's a little platform on the front left corner and a little platform on the front right corner. Um, so we start disassembling this, and you can kind of just see the mess here. I painted the front wall black. Um, I wanted to, uh, when I opened up the theater or the, um, the front screen, I wanted to be able to have that just kind of a dark color instead of the red. And so I decided to paint that black. Here's just all the mess, uh, all the speakers and, and all the uh, subwoofers. And so that was in preparation for this new screen. I'm sorry, the new cabinet. So here we begin the building and construction of that. So this was this was all kind of built over a six month period. And then um, we ended up bringing that from his house over to my house and began to assemble this. 
And so you can see here, these are some really, really thick and long uh, lag bolts that went right down into the concrete foundation. We wanted to make sure that this cabinet was absolutely not going to go anywhere. And you can see kind of uh, just a perspective of just how large these lag bolts are. And so these are some more construction photos. So you can see on that back front wall, um, that's part of the where the platform is going to rest. And so here you can see that middle section now is installed. We've got the frame installed. We've got um, the um, half of the um, column over on the far right, just kind of getting a visual of where that's going to be and how we're going to install that. And then we begin to add what we call the diamond pattern, which that's up at the very, very top there. And so it's starting to shape, take shape. And then we've got, I think that's kind of the same photo. Okay, so this is just showing the, um, the bottom cabinet, how that extends out on those rails. And then we get the speakers added in there. And then we begin to start adding the doors and the lighting. And, and here was kind of the finished product. And so this was the La Scala's with the RSW-15s. And, and we're ready to rock and roll with this new 150-inch screen with the La Scala Trio is what I always called it. So here's a little close-up shot of that. And still to this day, that's one of my favorite photos that I've taken in my theater room. I just thought it looked really cool. You had that vintage La Scala's um, and just, you know, this double stacked 15 inch subwoofers. And so there's a, a shot of the final front cabinet after it was all constructed. So there's the back of the room. And again, my photos, for whatever reason, always turned out like fire engine red. Um, take a look at these seats because later on, of course, we upgrade those down the road. But um, after using these for about, uh, I guess, about 12 years, they definitely had a lot of wear and tear on them. So we ended up selling the, um, the Eclipse RSW-15s after reviewing the SVS PB-16s. Fell in love with those. They dug a little bit deeper. Of course, they're a lot newer. Um, they've got warranty. So I ended up selling all four of my uh, RSW-15s. Ended up purchasing the pair of SVS PB-16s. Rocked those for a couple years. At that point, we're like, you know what? We're going to start doing this thing called Atmos. And I kind of drug my feet on that for a while. I kind of thought maybe it's just a gimmick. Um, but... I was like, you know what, let's just go for it. So I installed four in-ceiling speakers, and that really took my theater to a new level, and I've really enjoyed Dolby Atmos in my, um, my theater room. And so those are the Klipsch CDT 5800 version 2s. And you can also see when I did that, I finally decided to paint all the air vents, all of the trim rings around the lights, um, and then any of the covers up there painted those black as well so that pretty much everything disappears um, up there except for the actual light bulbs themselves. So here, of course, we've upgraded uh, once again. The subwoofers took my theater room to an entirely new level. JTR Captivator RS2s. These are dual 18-inch uh, drivers in a sealed cabinet with a 4,000 wood. 4,000 watt continuous amplifier in each cabinet. And so these things just absolutely pound in my room right now using a mini DSP. I'm flat down to about five Hertz. And so these things just have a ridiculous amount of output, super, super clean. And I've just been incredibly impressed with them. So this is the La Scala's. They are gone. Um, I ended up selling those to one of my patrons and he absolutely loved them. These are just temporarily in his uh, living room. He also has a dedicated theater room about the size of mine. And so he was in the process of building that. And so I delivered them to his home. We set them up in here. And then he was going to eventually move them into his home theater room. So these are in their new home. So I sold those to upgrade to the JTR, Cap I'm sorry, JTR Noesis 212 HTRs. And so I've got just an identical LCR here, flew up to uh, Wisconsin, heard JTR speakers for the first time, was blown away and knew that was the direction I wanted to go in my theater room. They have a lot of the same characteristics as Klipsch. They've got the same clarity, detail, dynamics, but they just, again, they just took it to a whole new level. 
and sound absolutely phenomenal. So here you can see on the side walls, we finally began to repaint and, and kind of change up the room. It almost looks green, but it's really more gray. Um, but I've got a video on the channel on, I can't believe it took me 14 years to do this. And that was to paint the room and, and kind of update it. You can also see at the top left, I've got some really thick curtains that definitely helped out a lot with the acoustics in my room. And then on the other side of the room, I did the same thing, added those same curtains. They're really, really thick. And you can also see uh, the Valencia seating. So I ended up selling my original seats after reviewing some of the Valencia seats. And so those were a huge upgrade from my other original seats. And here you can see those once again. In the very back, you can see... Um, we ended up upgrading to the, uh, I had several projectors. We went from a Panasonic AE3000 to the 8000 to the Epson 5040UB and then to the JVC NX7 that I have now. When I upgraded to the JVC, that was after we built the new cabinet and I knew that I was going to need a, a bigger, better projector. Um, and so that's when I made that jump uh, to the 150 inch screen with the NX7. And in order to get a 150 inch screen or image size in my room, I had to back it up outside the room, which was actually a huge blessing because now I didn't have to worry about my head hitting it, but it also removed a lot of the heat and the noise from the projector because that's now outside the room. So here, uh, kind of one of the most recent things we've done on the channel and in the room is upgrade the acoustic panels. And so for the most part, um, there hasn't been a huge change in sound. Um, definitely sounds different, but I wouldn't say that it sounds like massively better and it definitely doesn't sound any worse uh, by any means, but they look really, really cool. And then uh, in the future, we're going to be adding some panels to the ceiling and also inside the cabinet because there's no acoustic treatment inside that. So there's just a little shot of the side walls with the new uh, GIK acoustic panels installed and there's a few on that back wall because that had some really hard reflection surfaces as well. And then there's good old Morgan Freeman on the front. Um, just a little insider uh, fo or inside information. This is a composite photo. So basically, you know, of course, when you take a photo of your theater room with the lights on, it's going to be pretty washed out. Uh, if you take it with the lights off, it's going to have a beautiful picture. So I did both. I took a picture of the front wall with the lights on, and then I took a picture with the lights off, and then in Photoshop composited those together. Um, so in a way, it's a fake photo, but it is my real photo photo. Um, the real image quality of the JVC NX7. Um, so again, that's just a little insider thing. So anyway, guys, that is my home theater journey. Uh, my hope and my prayer through sharing all of that is that if you're especially new to home theater and you're just thinking, man, I'd love to have a theater room. Um, guys, this took me 15 years to get to the point that I'm at now. It's something that isn't going to typically happen overnight. And I always thought, like uh, I see sometimes in my comments, that you had to be rich to have a dedicated theater room. And that is not the case. There's a lot of great deals out there in the used market. Sometimes you can buy it off of a friend that's upgrading and, and save quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can do, as you heard me in my story, I've bartered for a lot of things. I've bartered for subwoofers in the past and built, I did some business cards and some graphic work for a guy and he gave me some subwoofers and so forth. So um, there's definitely a lot of ways you can get creative in building your home theater. Definitely if you can build stuff on your own, whether it's DIY acoustic panels or like we did building our riser, that just saves a ton of money. Um, and so you can do this. Uh, you really can. I think everybody can have a theater room, whether it's in your living room, a basement, uh, a bonus room, or even a bedroom or a garage. Well, guys, if you found this video helpful to you, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel because I produce weekly content that I'm sure you'll enjoy. And as always, you guys be blessed, and we'll catch you in the next video.